we go. It should work pretty quick here. Here it is. Okay. There it is. All right. So, uh, Ron, why don't you kind of uh, direct the meeting? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard. It's our November 4th, first Friday of the month meeting without our president at the moment. And uh, my name is Ron Heron. I've been uh, vice president proudly for several years. Jerry's been in there, I think, a year longer. Young man who used to hold this position is down at Caltech, Adrian Lopez. And there he comes. I see our logo joining us. Maybe that'll be Mr. President, and I'll introduce him. There he Can you hear us? Unmute yourself, Jerry Wilson. And I'll give you an introduction just like our Monday morning podcast. We don't hear you. Hey, there. I'm Jerry, president of the me of the uh, this motley crew. I mean the SBAU. <laughs> uh, sorry about the computer glitch, but I'm back on now. How far did we get into the meeting? I just basically kicked it off. We just got okay. back on. Well, we're live first, on YouTube. What's that? We're live on YouTube. Yeah, got that. Got it. Got it. Okay. The next thing is we're going to hear from our outreach person on the um, um, outreach coming up for November. Chuck? We, we didn't really hear anything much about like uh, the next meeting and other things, but uh, as far as outreach this month, uh, we've already had one rained out, which is good news, which was Telescope Tuesday on Tuesday. Um, we have uh, not really outreach, but the eclipse, the total lunar eclipse coming up starting a little after 2 a.m. on uh, Tuesday morning. Uh -oh. oh, oh, weird. Wait a well, let's see. Yeah. We're, we're still... We're still uh, uh, go, Assuming, back to, so go back to we're still live streaming. I think we're still live streaming, I hope, but I'll click on record again here. Okay. Oh, please ask the host, give permission. You know, so you somehow you're the host, Jerry, I think, back now. So you can record okay. on your computer just for, for grins. Okay. 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 Yep. We're Sorry about that. Business. All right. So we have uh, on Thursday the 10th, uh, we have a Peabody School. Uh, with a with a night for them set up at 5 15 p.m. We come in through a gate on the uh, southwest side of the campus and set up on the blacktop. Uh, then on um, Friday the 11th, we have a big group for something they're calling Camp Westmont out at Westmont College. So this is for for students. Uh, they're expecting 200 of them. Uh, and wow. uh, we're going to set up scopes around the observatory, but a little bit away from the observatory because they're gonna be having fire pits and s'mores and lanterns and stuff around the observatory. But it's people that sort of don't understand astronomy yet, but we'll try to uh, show them the error of their ways. <laughs> and then uh, on Saturday, the 12th, second Saturday, it's uh, we'll have our planning meeting at uh, five o'clock. And then uh, it's the star party, the public star party uh, starting at seven. And uh, then uh, our only other event is the third Friday, the 18th at Westmont, uh, was set up at 6 p.m. So it's a quiet month. Okay, good. We do need to step up our outreach, though. I hear there was a woman down in um, Carpinteria that did not understand the meaning of tides, and she parked her Tesla on the beach. So we <laughs> need to step up our outreach to explain people about tides. <laughs> and our next meeting um, next month will be a hybrid meeting. It'll be partly Zoom, like this one is all Zoom, and partly in the, me in the meeting hall at Farrand Hall. It may be our transition back to meet live meetings in person. And with that, I'm going to introduce the vice president, the Baron Ron Heron, who will introduce our speaker. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Does Chrissy Does have I anything have to say, Chrissy? Flowing. How about uh, Chrissy? Uh, yeah, like Chrissy Cook is uh, with the museum and the planetarium. What do you, what's your report real fast? I just wanted to also let everybody know about an exciting free lecture the museum is co-sponsoring with UCSB. It's uh, on Monday, November 14th at 4 p.m. and it's in Campbell Hall. It's totally free. They would like you to RSVP. But it's part, it's uh, through the International Education Week and Dr. Matthew Greenhouse, who's been working on the James Webb Space Telescope since 1997 and is an expert in infrared spectroscopy, will be the speaker. So if you are into it, there are the details right there. Thank you so much for sharing that for us. The museum would, of course, love you to attend. And I also want to make sure, I know we already said it, but we'll be back uh, hybrid 
for the December meeting. We're starting to meet in person. We hope you will come in person to Ferent Hall at the museum. We're, if we had a red carpet, I'd roll it out for you. If you're still not ready for that, that's okay. We'll also have a Zoom option available for people who still would rather stay home to participate in the monthly meetings. But we're thrilled we'll have the planetarium pre-show before the regular meeting time at 7.30. So if you want to see that, be here at 7. I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, everyone. But we're going to be hybrid, Christy. That means half gas and half electrical, like a Tesla. <laughs> Something like that. I guess people know what we're talking about. Uh, real quickly, I'll offer Mrs. Uh, McPartland a shot if there's anything from the merchandise department to report. Uh, yeah, there's always uh, sweatshirts <laughs> like this one. Uh, there's T-shirts that are long sleeve and short sleeve. Um, there's hats. Uh, there's uh, uh, blankets. blankets and a couple of tote bags. Um, you can see it all on sbau.org. Uh, and if you would like something then oh and here it comes thank you tom and then there's, <laughs> there don't, don't forget there's the coveted sbau coffee cup which rory will soon be receiving <laughs> <laughs> and yes. i seem i seem to be the only one that's geared up for the new cold weather by wearing our official uh whatever they're called jacket uh, sweater with the logo on it that i bought years ago still fits me and it's warm as all get out um, over here Tis the season. We'll find out what our special guest speaker who's on the screen is wearing. It looks rather, well, from the, on board the Star Trek ship. I'm not sure <laughs> what it is. Uh, don't forget Monday morning, 11 noon, we gather together just like this. Uh, most of us are on the screen for our monthly or our weekly podcast. It's uh, also a vlog. You can see us again. That'll be Monday, 11 a.m. to noon, SBAU Astro Hour. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our science speaker of the month of November for SBAU, the fourth year online general meeting, yet another one of those incredible new generation of bright young grad students down at uh, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. Rory has been passionate about astrophysics since he was a young man. You see on the screen compared to the rest of us, he's still a very young man. And he's been an amateur astronomer since uh, age 11, volunteered and worked at Highland Road Park Observatory in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, through high school and college. That college, I believe, is LSU, graduating with a physics degree, Louisiana State University, in 2018. And then he came west, got tired of the... Uh, the hurricanes has been waking. Uh, was that the word I got? No, he's been uh, working. That's, I can't read my own scribbles. Working with UCLA's Professor Tuan Do and Andrea Gez, G-H-E-Z. I swear I saw her recently on a YouTube video about, uh, I think, JPL or maybe a Mars rover or something. Might have been the DART mission. Anyway, his talk, ladies and gentlemen, takes us deep into the bowels of the Milky Way. It's called the Extreme Realm of the Milky Way's poor. Ladies and gentlemen, Rory O.J. Bentley, thank you for joining us, Rory. <laughs> All righty, so I'm gonna actually. Join us now and run his own show. Okay, so can you see the, uh, the screen? Yes. yes. All right, perfect. Okay, so, um, Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for the excellent introduction, Ron. I'm flattered. Um, so again, my name is Rory Bentley. I'm a uh, fifth year grad student at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, and I'm going to tell you today about what my research um, group, me and my research group do, uh, studies um, and has been studying for actually decades now. Um, looking at the uh, very extreme and very unique region that is our Milky Way's galactic center. So um, why do we care about the center of the galaxy? Well, for one thing, uh, we think without going into, um, well, we think that the centers of galaxies are very important in both like the formation of galaxies um, throughout the universe and also how they evolve over time. Um, are, uh, they're sort of the kind of the, the, the pin, the keystone of the um, of kind of the formation mechanisms behind galaxies. Um, and our, our Milky Way is, is a pretty big galaxy. It's, um, it's not anomalously big, but it's, um, 
a kind of a big one. It's, it's quite distinctive. Um, we're located about halfway to the edge of it. Um, this diagram just shows you kind of a, a nice little schematic of the Milky Way. Galactic, Galactic Center is located at the bright central bar in the, the middle, and we're about halfway to the edge in this little feature called the Orion Spur. Uh, our distance to the Galactic Center, uh, we now know it's about 26,000 light years. So uh, the, our Galactic Center in particular is a unique place um, in modern astronomy because it's the only galactic center that we can actually observe in any appreciable detail. Um, the nearest kind of comparable galactic center is in the Andromeda galaxy, which is about 2.5 million light years away or a hundred times further away than our own. And so uh, if we're, we can see details in our own galactic center that we can see literally nowhere else in the universe. And so that makes it extremely important and extremely an extremely unique um, thing to study. Um, there's a bit of a problem though. Um, we can't actually, if you go, like, you go outside and you see it, and you look at it with your, um, uh, you look at it like uh, with your own eyes, you know, you go out and I don't know, to the desert or something in, in like August or September, and you look in the, the direction of the galactic center, you can't actually see it. So, this picture just shows you um, the area of the Milky Way around the galactic center. Um, some of y'all may recognize, uh, you know, Sagittarius is on the left, Scorpius is on the right. And this big arrow points to the location of uh, the, the, basically the exact center of our galaxy. You don't really see anything. It's just sort of a, a uh, you see that big black smudge. And that, um, that smudge, uh, for those of you who don't know, is, uh, a massive cloud of dust between here and there, between here and the galactic center. The Milky Way is an extremely dusty place and that um, all that interstellar dust blocks um, the light, at least at wavelengths that we can see. So I just sort of hinted at the solution to this problem, but how do we see through this 26,000 light years of dust between us and the galactic center? The simple answer is you just use other wavelengths of light. Um, it turns out that uh, longer wavelengths of light um, beyond what we can see, uh, for example, infrared, microwave, and radio wavelengths can actually pass through this dust, this interstellar dust much more easily. And so um, if you were to look at the galactic center in kind of visual wavelengths that, you know, that our eyes can see, you don't see anything. But if you then say, look in the near infrared or wavelengths that are actually just a little ways uh, past what, what our eyes can see, suddenly you see so much more detail and you can see um, all this bright, um, all these bright stars going all the way to the very center of the galaxy. There's still a little bit of dust that's blocking light, but not as much. And as you go to even longer wavelengths, the dust effect gets uh, even less uh, significant. Um, so I, I sort of just went over this slide. Um, other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum beyond what our eyes can see can penetrate um, all this interstellar dust. Um, and so um, that, that allows us to actually study this very important region, which you, um, for the majority of kind of astro astronomical history was basically completely unknown. Um, looking at also um, different wavelengths of light also is really important because it allows us to study um, different astronomical objects and different aspects of these astronomical objects. Uh, if this figure just shows the galactic center again in four different kind of wavelengths of light, you have microwaves up at the top. Um, microwaves typically show you, um, they're most commonly used for studying kind of uh, warmish dust and um, uh, in the warmish dust in the sky, um, along with sometimes um, kind of interstellar molecules. Uh, and so this is really useful for probing um, 
like young stars and such. Uh, infrared, which is the second panel, um, this is better suited for uh, like studies of star formation regions and um, kind of hot, hotter gas. Um, JWST is operating uh, partially in the infrared. Uh, the near infrared uh, is actually probably the best wavelength um, uh, to study stars in, in because star, basically all stars emit a lot of near infrared light. Um, and this near infrared light can get through interstellar dust. And so we can see study stars all across the galaxy. Uh, JWST is also using um, near infrared. It also can take near infrared uh, data as well. And then we have visual, uh, visible on the bottom, which is useful for studying in astronomy like hot stars and again, uh, star formation regions, but you can't see the galactic center in the vi visible, visual. So we're not gonna talk about it too much. Um, just again, this is actually, this image is a set of four views of the galactic center in different wavelengths. It's right down there in the center. So um, because we can't see the galactic center, um, the galactic center's like uh, location in the uh, visual, we weren't actually able to discover its true location until the uh, first like, uh, until the first kind of radio telescope observation, or some of the first radio telescope observations were done in the mid 50s. Um, in the mid 50s, when we started doing radio observations, when we looked um, at kind of at the border of Sagittarius and Scorpius, there was an immensely bright radio feature. Um, this feature uh, was given the label Sagittarius A because it's the brightest radio feature located in. Um, Sagittarius. And um, we at that time, we had a vague hint about uh, where the galactic center lot um, was located, but this sort of gave us the first actual kind of proof of its exact location. Uh, this picture is a more recent uh, photo of Sagittarius A and the region around it. Um, it's this bright, uh, blob right here in the center. And you can see that there's a bunch of complicated structures nearby. Um, but we're gonna zoom in a little on Sagittarius A. So um, as telescopes improved and we started in addition to doing radio observations, uh, perform uh, infrared observations, we started to learn a lot more about what was going on um, in Sagittarius A. Uh, radio observations, like what you see here on the um, on, on the on the left, um, revealed a complex kind of weird swirling structure of gas, along with a really bright um, radio source um, about which everything seemed to be swirling around. Um, this bright radio source, um, which looked almost like a star in radio wavelengths, which was really weird, which is really strange and unexpected, uh, was given the name Sagittarius A star, because it's the star-like object in Sagittarius A. Um, for short, uh, people and, uh, started referring to it as Sag A star, and that name has stuck. Uh, so uh, from now on, I'm just gonna be referring to it as Sag A star. Additionally, infrared observations um, of the galactic center also show, started to reveal the presence of a whole bunch of stars, a big star cluster centered almost exactly on Sagittarius A star. Um, and so, but the problem is, I'm, there's still a few problems. First of all, um, even though I've mentioned that the galactic center is the closest galactic center to us, it's not actually that close. So in order to um, resolve um, the structures in the galactic center, we still need some of the highest angular resolution um, measurements we can make on the sky. And then um, this means we actually need uh, some of the biggest and the best telescopes in the world to study the galactic center. Um, 
here at the UC in the UCLA Galactic Center Group, um, we tip we use uh, the twin uh, ten meter telescope, uh, ten meter Keck telescopes on the summit of Mauna Kea, which you see here on the right. Um, these are probably uh, some of, like these two telescopes are. They're not technically the largest uh, um, kind of infrared and optical telescopes in the world, but they're pretty. They're, they're pretty much the best. So um, they're uh, kind of ideal for our studies, um, at least in the infrared. Uh, and we've been using these. Oh, I see a comment in the chat. Uh, uh, what is the diameter of that circle? Uh, showing objects around Sag star. Is that, um, let me go back. This one? Um, yes, Rory, just that okay. dot, dot. Is that dot the same as that circle that you showed be, the slide before? Uh, that dot is actually about the same, maybe a, uh, about the size of this, the whole circle that we see here. So, um, this whole circle, it fits in this little dot right here. It's it's really tiny on the sky. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. No problem. Um, so the UCLA Galactic Center Group has been um, has been studying the innermost portion of the galaxy for about twenty years now. For, actually, for over twenty years now. They started actually before I was born. I'm the uh, I think I'm the first graduate student in the group that's younger than the actual group itself. So that's kind of, kind of funny. Um, and we've been, um, some of the founding members of the group, um, Eric Becklin and Mark Morris, have, were actually some of the first people to do infrared observations of the Galactic Center and uh, uh, like identify some of the first stars in the Galactic Center. Um, and we've been using the, uh, the Keck telescopes that I mentioned previously, um, basically since they finished construction uh, in the mid nineties to study the galactic center. So they've been our, our workhorses for approaching three decades now. And this is a photo of us um, actually taken of us when we had control over both telescopes observing the galactic center. Um, I'm gonna, these lasers are used for um, uh, they're called adaptive optics lasers, and they're used for correcting uh, optical distortions in the atmosphere. I'm not really going to talk about that in the talk, but ask me about it later if you want to. So uh, what have we found in this 20, 25 years of studies? Well, uh, the center of the galaxy is one of the densest concentrations of stars known. Uh, this photo shows the um, star cluster at the galactic center, which we usually refer to as the nuclear star cluster, um, with a bar indicating the distance between sun, the sun and Alpha Centauri. So this is about four light years. Um, you can see that there is a ton of stars crammed in this little picture. And um, I actually wanna note that most of the stars in the nuclear star cluster are too faint to be able to be detected in this image. Um, in the local stellar neighborhood, there's about uh, 0.01 stars per cubic light year. So you take a random cubic light year of space near us, near the sun, you have a one in a hundred chance of getting a star. If you were to take a cubic light year centered on Sagittarius A star, get the core of the nuclear star cluster, you would probably have about five to 10 million stars in that little box. So the stellar density here is incredible. Um, pretty unprecedented in the galaxy. Uh, additionally, uh, over the course of our uh, studies of the galactic center, we can actually see the stars move in the very center of the nuclear star cluster. Um, this is a video showing uh, nearly, a, I think, two decades of observations of the innermost stars of the galactic center. And you can see that they're um, kind of swirling around something. Um, this bright star here is SO2. Um, it's the group's favorite star. It's a bright star located uh, very close to Sagittarius A star, 
and it appears to circle it about every 15 years. You can see it's um, completes its little orbit uh, uh, over the course of this video. So, um, okay, next. So SO2, uh, here's another little video showing the orbit. Um, it's this yellow one here uh, that is exceptionally bright. And this star locates the, indicates the location of Sagittarius A star. SO2 is absolutely booking it. It's, um, as it swings closest to Sagittarius A star in its orbit, it reaches about 5,000 miles per second, um, which is about 3% the speed of light. Now, SO2 for context is a really, it's a, actually a really big star. Um, I think it's about, um, if I recall, it's close to 10 to 20,000 times the brightness of the sun. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an enormous star and it's something is absolutely slinging it through uh, this 15 year orbit. Um, so what, um, what is moving? What's causing it to uh, kind of orbits uh, cover such a huge distance so quickly? Well, uh, the only thing that can move a star that fast um, and actually and be basically undetectable because you SO2 doesn't appear to be orbiting, well, really anything. Um, the only thing that Sagittarius could be, or Sag A star could be, is a huge black hole. Um, SO2 is moving extremely fast, which means it has to be orbiting something really massive but we can't see that. And SO2 also doesn't appear to be slamming into anything or um, as it orbits the black hole. So it has to be really tiny. Uh, we now think that um, through our observations of the innermost stars um, of the, the Milky Way, that Sagittarius A star is a supermassive black hole with a mass of about 4 million times the mass of the sun, which is absolutely gigantic. Um, and um, let's see, it's the, uh, ac it's absolutely gigantic and it's probably, and it's located at the exact center of the galaxy. And so we think that it's basically holding it, you can almost think of it as like the little pin that's holding everything, holding the entire rest of the galaxy together. Um, I mentioned that you can't, uh, that we can't see Sagittarius A star, but that's not quite true. Because if we watch Sagittarius A star over time, you actually, it look, there's like, it flares a little bit. Now, okay, black holes are black. How is it like emitting, how does it appear to be emitting light? Um, what we're actually seeing is uh, material that gets uh, heated up and starts to glow as it falls into the black hole. Um, and so like there's a lot of dust and gas in the galactic center. You'll have a, like a blob of it. We'll get, uh, we'll just get be in a kind of the wrong place at the wrong time and get knocked into Sagittarius A star. It heats up as it falls in, glows extremely brightly until it hits the event horizon or the, the kind of the black, the point of no return in which it um, the black hole uh, basically swallows it. And, Actually, um, this video, oh, whoops. Uh, uh, you can actually see these flares on a, a minute by minute uh, kind of time as you're taking observations. So um, over the course of a night, you can basically see Sagittarius uh, Sag star will be, you know, completely invisible. And then some, uh, after a few minutes, something will fall into it. It'll get really bright for maybe 30 minutes or so and then fade away. So it, even throughout the night, you can actually see change in, in kind of uh, activity um, just kind of going on in your observations, which is really rare at, in astronomy. And so this is another example of just kind of how unique the Galactic Center is. Uh, additionally, some kind of relevant news, um, in May of this year, uh, astronomers using a network of um, 
radio telescopes around the world um, uh, released the uh, actually an image of Sagittarius A star itself. Um, there's this technique that you can do in, um, for those of you who might not know this, but in uh, radio astronomy called interferometry, which is basically combining, um, you can combine the signals of two, tele two radio telescopes um, a long ways away to get, uh, and it effectively allows you to get, um, act as like a huge mirror. Um, the details are extremely complicated, so. I'll just kind of go over it, but it allows you to get super high uh, resolute, like angular resolution images on the sky and see really tiny things. And so astronomers connected uh, telescopes across the world, which gave us absolutely um, insane resolution on the sky to take a, uh, a picture of a black hole. Um, you see this picture here on the, on the left. And so, um, you have this kind of ring of uh, kind of emission around the black hole, um, which is uh, glowing material as it falls into the black hole, kind of swirling around it. Um, and then at the very center, you see a black dot, which is uh, this, uh, which is the event horizon of the black hole or the point where no light can escape. And so it's this kind of black orb sitting in space. And this is, uh, this isn't technically the first image of a, of a, well, it isn't actually the first image of a black hole. There's, um, the group studied another supermassive black hole, which you can also uh, take a picture of. But this is, um, this image was really relevant to our science because this is, this is our, our black hole. This is um, our boy. <laughs> um, so, uh, in addition to a supermassive black hole, um, you also have the stars surrounding it. And that, as it turns out, the, the surrounding nuclear star cluster is just about as interesting as the black hole itself. Um, when we look at there's uh, when we look at it, uh, we see that it's actually an incredibly complicated uh, region of uh, kind of collection of stars. The first thing was. Um, the, some of the first stars that we found in the nuclear star cluster uh, were actually very young stars with ages of only a couple million years old. Now this was extremely surprising when it was first, when, the, when these stars were first found because it was thought that all the stars in the galactic center should be very old. Um, it's thought that the tidal, kind of the gravitational tidal forces from a supermassive black hole um, would rip apart any kind of forming stars before they had a chance to um, become stars proper. And so the only stars that we would expect to see would be old stars that just sort of fell in over the courses, the course of um, like billions of years. Instead, we see stars, some of the youngest stars known, um, actually, with ages of only a few million years old. Uh, I see I have another comment. Um, so uh, the question is, why doesn't the black hole's gravity pull all the stars in? That's a, a good question. So the reason is um, because uh, although the, uh, the black hole is extremely massive, um, it, um, it still has to obey the same, like the, uh, it still has to obey, obey the laws of gravity. Um, and Although like the, the gravitational pull of the black hole is immense, um, the stars are kind of like how the planets are able to orbit the sun without uh, falling into the sun, they're able to orbit the black hole. It's, um, it's just kind of the same, the same physics as what goes on in our solar system, on like a, in our solar system with the sun or the planets orbiting the sun, moons orbiting the planets just translated to an even bigger scale. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, actually, actually there, there, there'll be a bit of a delay, so maybe um, just- Yeah, gonna... there, there, there won't be any verbal reply on that one. Okay, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, 
Uh, I, I, have a, I have a quick question, Rory, if you don't mind. You may be covering this. A lot of times we jump the gun on the speakers. Do they ever collide or when it does suck in a star, can the LIGO gravitational wave detector pick that up? Is that a major collision or are we talking four okay. million times the sun versus two or three doesn't make much of a, collide, a collision? So um, as far as LIGO detecting a star, falling into a supermassive black hole. I'm not sure if, like, I'm not sure if the signal is strong enough for that. I will note, uh, we've never seen a star fall into the black hole, the supermassive black hole in our galaxy, but the reason to believe that we've actually seen it happen, uh, stars fall into supermassive black holes in other galaxies. Oh. So it does happen, but it's extremely rare. Isn't uh, that LIGO detector in your home state? Yeah, it's about 45 minutes from my house, from my uh, parents' house. <laughs> the other one's in the Pacific Northwest, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's in the middle of nowhere in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no problem. But uh, so we see a lot of young stars in the galactic center. And this picture showing oh, the stars in the galactic center um, with the these X's marking the locations of young stars. And you can see that there are a lot. Uh, SO2, the star that we mentioned earlier, is a good example of one of the young stars in the, uh, in the galactic center. To this day, we still don't really have a good idea about how all these young stars um, got there. Um, there's we're kind of hot on the trail for finding out, um, for finding a physical mechanism that can produce um, like young stars in the galactic center, but we still don't really have like a, a smoking gun piece of evidence of what, how exactly it happens. Um, this is actually part of uh, uh, some of the work that I'm doing at the moment is looking for um, kind of looking, uh, trying to un better understand the young stars in the galactic center and find uh, pieces of evidence that can better inform us about how they formed. Um, again, you can ask me about that uh, later. So another interesting thing about these black, about these young stars is that we think that the, um, the winds from these stars provide most of the material that is falling, that we see falling into the supermassive black hole. A lot of the stars in the galactic center are a type of star that, um, if it's a, are actually a type of very rare star called a wolf rayet star. Um, a wolf rayet star is the very last phase um, of the most massive stars evolution of their life cycles. So um, right before they explode as a supernova, they become what is, we call a wolf rayet star. And in the wolf, a wolf ray star is actually, uh, it's shedding massive amounts of mass. So these, there's a big, um, really powerful kind of stream of material coming off the surface of these stars. On the left, we have an example of a wolf ray star. Um, this is not one in the galactic center, but you can very clearly see it's surrounded by this bright nebula of material that has been basically kicked off of the star's surface. And there's about 30 of these stars in the galactic center, which is a weird thing in its own because um, there's not actually that many of these stars known. And we think that the winds of these stars are providing most of the material falling onto Sagittarius A star. This is another thing uh, that I've, I'm currently studying. Um, additionally, um, in addition to the young stars, we also have a big collection of older stars mixed in. Um, these older stars are themselves a kind of a weird population because they're in a, uh, when we look at the, actually look at the chemical compositions of these stars, which you can get from, um, from spectroscopy, we see that there is a huge diversity in um, chemical compositions. And the chemical composition of a star um, is it tells you actually a lot about the environment in which a star formed. Um, and when we look at the chemical compositions of these stars, they seem 
really weird compared to uh, a few of them seem really weird compared to other stars in the Milky Way. Um, and they're actually the chemical composition is closer to what we would expect to find in um, smaller dwarf galaxies outside our own. Um, so there's some evidence um, uh, that I, I was actually uh, one of the kind of uh, lead researchers on uh, that, uh, in, that suggests that some of the stars in the galactic center may have come from a small galaxy that got pulled apart by the gravity of the massive Milky Way galaxy. The stars fell into the galactic center and got mixed up, or kind of mixed in with the local population to form the nuclear star cluster that we see today. So I worked, I worked on this for my first kind of two or three years here at UCLA. Um, additionally, in addition to stars surrounding the um, Sagittarius A star, we see these small, really compact gas clouds that are kind of swinging around the um, Sagittarius A star in their own orbits. These kind of tiny little gas clouds we call the G objects. And what we, um, we think they are is that they were actually, uh, they started off as like a fairly close binary star, uh, two stars orbiting each other pretty close. Um, and then tidal forces from uh, Sagittarius A star slowly tugged and kind of twisted these stars orbits until they slammed into each other at some point um, in, the recent, in recent history. And when they crashed into each other, a bunch of gas was thrown off to form um, the puffy gas clouds that we see today. Uh, this has not been confirmed, but we have uh, some pretty good, uh, we have some pretty, hopefully pretty strong evidence that that's what occurred. And uh, this is a really kind of popular ongoing topic of um, study in the group, these uh, G objects. Um, Additionally, um, the, since we've uh, been studying the stars orbiting Sag A star every year for over two decades now, uh, we've been able to make really precise measurements of the orbits of these stars. Uh, this animation just shows you um, kind of some of the orbits or orbit estimates for our, uh, the stars. Um, let's restart the video. Uh, the, the colors of the stars indicate um, the if they're young or old, or blue, kind of the teal stars are young stars, orange stars are old stars, and I think the purple stars are ones uh, where we don't really know um, if they're young or old or not, because sometimes it's actually pretty hard to tell. Um, but uh, this kind of long, uh, kind of these long period observations have allowed us to make really good measurements of the orbits of these stars. So why is that important? Well, uh, one of the things that it, it allows us to do is actually uh, perform uh, tests of Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity. And um, in 2018, we were able to do a really important test uh, when SO2 swung closest to the black hole uh, as on its 15 year orbit. Um, and um, we were able to do, uh, the thing that we were trying to measure is this thing called gravitational redshift, which is um, basically the light from, uh, that's emitted by the star will be, as it leaves, um, as it leaves the star, uh, will actually get, um, it will actually get shifted to the red slightly um, by the immense pull, by the immense gravity of the supermassive black hole. And um, this is a prediction of general relativity. And you can only really study it um, on this scale in the galactic center because you have such a massive black hole. Now, the trick with this, and the reason we needed to um, get the long-term observations to do this test is because um, as, SO2 orbits the black hole, um, its motion uh, actually um, there's a slight Doppler shift as it moves towards us or away from us. Um, so kind of like how 
um, you, when you're listening to a fire truck, you can hear um, the uh, kind of if it's moving towards you or away from you by the kind of the pitch of the siren. Um, the light from astronomical objects as they move more move towards you or away from you will either um, be shifted or um, it'll be slightly uh, blue shifted if it's moving towards you or red shifted if it's moving away from you. And so if we measure the kind of the red shift as we call it of SO2, um, we're suddenly gonna have these two effects um, the general relativistic uh, effect, uh, red shift versus just the orbital motion um, will suddenly be kind of competing with each other. And so you need to know the star's orbit and thus it's kind of orbital red shift really well in order to detect the smaller um, GR red shift. And so uh, in 2018, we were able to make this measurement and detect uh, the gravitational redshift of the star. And um, this was sort of the, the leading uh, kind of discovery, or one of the leading discoveries for the 2020 Nobel Prize. So um, because this was like the first test, um, so actually, what's the best way to put this? So, the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to uh, three people. The uh, award was split. One went to Roger Penrose, who's a physicist who um, studies black holes. Um, and the other, uh, uh, the, the other part of the award went to Andrea Ghez, the leader of the UCLA Galactic Center Group, along with Reinhard Genzel, who's doing um, similar studies at the Galactic Center uh, at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And so uh, uh, Andrea and Reinhard both got um, uh, kind of, they both split the award for making simultaneous measurements of this, um, uh, of this gravitational redshift, which took like decades upon, uh, of, of work to perform and was really the first of its kind um, in astronomy. Uh, so um, that's been kind of the highlight of the past five years here in the Galactic Center Group, but, um, uh, and it was the kind of the capstone of a lot of work, but there's still a lot of things we can, we can still learn in the Galactic Center. Um, this includes uh, more kind of fundamental tests of physics, um, kind of like that GR tests, along with um, kind of continuing the studies of the, the nuclear star cluster and the it's weird stellar population. Plus, um, another thing we actually have to look forward to is upgrades to telescopes. Um, so in the future, in the next uh, five to 20 years, we're gonna get a lot of upgrades to, um, and a lot of new exciting um, uh, instruments that allow us to study things that we, that we both know about already and things that we can't even conceive, like we have no idea um, about uh, in the future. And so that's super exciting. Uh, so this video, uh, it shows um, what we currently see on the, um, the rightmost, or on the leftmost panel uh, at the Galactic Center with the current um, uh, kind of telescope systems and uh, current um, Keck telescope. Uh, the one in the middle, shows what we expect to see in the next uh, five or so years once uh, some uh, new uh, kind of, uh, uh, once some new instrumentation and new uh, kind of telescope um, so systems are implemented in the telescope that will uh, help us improve uh, our observations. And then this rightmost panel is gonna be uh, what, we're, what we would expect to see at the Galactic Center um, in the next decade or two, once um, telescopes, even bigger telescopes come online, because uh, in the next decade or so, we expect some of the first telescopes um, with um, 30 meter diameters um, to come online. And these will uh, really push 
the boundaries of what we will see um, in astronomy. And they're kind of one of the next big things uh, to look forward to after uh, JWST. Um, so that's an exciting new thing for the future. And with that, um, I have thrown enough information at you. And so I'll just say thanks uh, for hosting me and I will take any questions. Anybody? Chuck? Yeah, I think we have some, I have a couple of questions myself, but uh, uh, can you play that last video of the uh, center there again? I, I'm curious uh, how much movement Sagittarius A star itself is doing in that in that area. Yeah, so Sag A star is just this little um, uh, white cross in the center. It doesn't actually like. So it is okay. So it is centered on that. Okay. Yeah. You can see um, there's this particular bright star that's orbiting it. Uh, you can see it in all three images. That's SO2. It's the brightest star that's kind of immediately close to the black hole. Um, these are all actually. I should note that these are all this uh, simulations. So you can see that as we get improved um, telescope optics and and such that we see even more and more stars closer and closer to the black hole. What it's funny. What Go ahead, Jerry. What wavelengths were taken for those images? Uh, these would be near infrared. Um, most of the um, science that we do in the Galactic Center Group um, is in the near infrared. Okay. So which do you think is the most effective at seeing through the dust? Microwaves, infrared, um, near infrared? It would be uh, like microwave and radio. Um, okay. At, at those wavelengths, um, the the dust is pretty much completely transparent. Right. So you're looking at near IR simply because the big optical telescopes operate there. Yeah, and also if you're interested in studying stars, you need to kind of look in the uh, the near IR because you can't yeah. don't, you don't see the stars in radio. Okay, go ahead, Tom. Uh, what was my question? I uh, the the ELT there. It's, uh, so it's funny that in, in the ELT uh, simulation there, it's showing the stars looking like snowflakes. I'm kind of curious why that would be. <laughs> okay. Um, some of that might be, um, there is, a, there will be a little bit of um, kind of uh, artifacts from each star, just from the, op from the t design of the telescope, um, kind of, I'm not sure fraction things it, going it, on. It looks like it's showing them as, as airy disks. So it's like yeah. saying, okay, this is really, really good resolution. Yeah, I think the like, ELTs um, are all pretty much going to be diffraction limited. So that's really good. Really exactly what we want. So, so Rory, do you have any statistics on the uh, the number and age, uh, uh, the number of stars and the ages of those stars in that galactic center. You said there's millions of stars there. In these images, I don't see millions of stars. Um, yeah. So I'm not, I'm curious, the millions of stars you're saying within a, a cubic light year, you were saying that you would see? So the reason is, is because um, even at the, like the galactic center, um, it's a long way away, uh, so we can only make out, where's it? The, uh, actually, I'll go back to the, that one picture with all the young stars. Um, even though the, uh, the galactic center, it, it's still a long way away, so the st even the brightest stars are not actually all that bright. Um, and so we, what we can only see is the, sort of the brightest tail or the tip kind of, if we look at like make a distribution Absolutely. of all the stars uh, sorted by brightness in the galactic center, we're only seeing the, um, the kind of the brightest the kind of end of those stars because we just, um, we just can't resolve the, the, even the fainter stars. Um, you're, you're talking about the red dwarfs and even smaller? Yeah, no, we can't like, if you were to put like, I'd probably put take, you know, Vega or something, which is a, a bright star, and put it in the galactic center, we wouldn't be able to see it. Um, I, I think we can, the faintest stars we can see are still a couple, several hundred times brighter than the sun. Wow, wow. 
Um, the stars that I study, the Wolf Rayet stars, um, they're these bright ones that you see up, um, but kind of the ones that I- Yeah, was, what, what is the typical mass of a Wolf Rayet? Uh, the typical mass, um, they form for stars with starting masses of about, uh, I think uh, 30 solar masses or higher. Um, mm, wow. And so like the stars that I study uh, in particular, they can be, we think some of them are probably one to two million times the luminosity of the star. Wow. So these are actually some of the brightest stars that we know of. Um, and so bright stars have short lives, right? The more massive, the shorter the life? Yeah, yeah. I mean, these stars, you know, the sun's going to live for um, uh, like probably 10, 10 billion years or so. The, the stars, the young stars that we see in the galactic center are maybe five to six million years old. And they're already, um, some of them probably have already exploded as supernovae. So, uh, yeah, so wow, that'd be something to see. I mean, I, I don't remember hearing things about supernovae uh, happening right at galactic centers anywhere out there in the universe. Uh, I, I thought that had not realized that that might be happening there. Just, oh, yeah. I mean, it'll happen. Yeah, I don't know if there, I don't think that there's any evidence for a like super recent supernova at the galactic center, but there is evidence for a uh, pretty nearby supernovae as well. Um, and actually there is some, now that I'm think, remembering it, there is some very indirect evidence that uh, some supernovae have happened recently, but um, we couldn't give you like a specific time. Right? In our galactic center, you mean? Yeah, yeah. There's no specific like supernova remnant with a pulsar in the center, like you see with the okay. crack. Although that one of the earlier images, the early radio image you showed, even though it's not zoomed in, there were a couple of supernova remnants in that. Oh yeah, yeah. There, those are some of the um, uh, uh, some of the supernovae remnants that like you see. These are further out. Um, there's even beyond just like the immediate area around the galactic center. Um, there's a lot of star formation and stuff. Um, it's a very. I was sort of focusing on the inner one or two light years. If you look at the uh, inner uh, like 100 to 200 light years, there's still a ton of star formation going on. Um, one of the most, it's one of the most active star formation regions in the, in the galaxy. So there's a lot of young stars, a lot of supernovae, crazy stuff going on beyond just this, what I, the kind of the tip of the iceberg of stuff that I talked about in this talk. Are, there, are you guys are you guys detecting uh, black holes or massive even supermassive black holes hanging around that same area? Um, that's a on a good ongoing uh, a good question, and it is there are um, ongoing studies for other um, uh, for other like really massive um, black holes in the galactic center. We don't think that there's any. Uh, like that are close to Sag star in mass, but there's been some claims of there being uh, maybe black holes that instead of have like several thousand solar masses um, in the galactic center, but none of them have been confirmed. And some of them are kind of, we think are kind of uh, sketchy, on sketchy evidence. Um, as far as other black holes, um, there is, uh, we are looking for uh, kind of indirect evidence of um, like objects that we can't see, like black holes or neutron stars, kind of in the immediate area around Sagittarius A star, because those objects are going to tug on the uh, stars, the stars orbit slightly and change them a little bit. Um, and so we now have precise enough measurements that we can actually start to look for those effects. Now this slide that you're showing up there says that the center was first ice identified in 1954, the radio telescopes. What was the feature that told people this was the center of our galaxy? Um, so the, the, the uh, we had at the time um, some ideas about where the center was um, because we 
uh, uh, because um, you can see glot there was you get more and more globular clusters in the direction of Sagittarius. Um, and also the, the Milky Way gets much brighter there. And so we had some hints about where it was um, that back uh, have some kind of had some guesses about where it was dating back to like the 20s or something. Mm -hmm. um, but, okay. uh, and then we sort of, off the top of my head, I don't actually remember how we kind of decided, oh okay. yeah, um, you know, Sagittarius A is the center of the galaxy. I think it was this sort of, just sort of gradual realization of over the course of a decade or something that people were like, oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's gotta be the center. That's gotta be it. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, at one time, Rory, the uh, Milky Way and probably all uh, circling galaxies had yeah. far more stars than they do now because they ended up as part of the four million suns inside that <laughs> supermassive black hole, didn't it? It keeps yeah. gobbling up and taking away stars. Yeah, there's um, actually, the, yeah, there's, I mean, we see in other galaxies, like um, in our galaxy, there's not actually that much material falling into Sagittarius star at the moment, but we see in the past that um, absolute, like a lot of like other galaxies have huge amounts of material falling into the black hole. Um, we have about a billionth of a solar mass per year of uh, falling into Sag A star on average, um, maybe 10 billionths. But in other galaxies, we can actually see up to about, uh, I think in some cases, we actually think we can see up to about 10 solar masses per year falling into the black hole, wow. which is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like quasars and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. Wow, this has been awesome. We thank you. You did a great job, my friend. Thank you so Very much. interesting work and a good presentation. Very yes. nice. Yeah, you're going to get a little thank care you. package from us in the mail, Rory, within the next few days. It'll probably come from Tom Totten. Uh, and I'm working on next month, and I'm going to count on Jerry and uh, possibly our outreach coordinator. And probably the lady that runs the planetarium, our connection to the museum to talk 20 minutes each. We'll talk about it next Ron, Saturday. I, Ron, I have Saturday one afternoon. final, I have a, a final question I want to sneak in for Sean Kelly. Oh. And I'll put it in the chat chat box. It says, uh, Sean Kelly fun. says, what do, you, what do you think about the, uh, think, did the galaxy come first or did the supermassive black hole come first? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think that's actually an ongoing, like, this is not, that's not quite my field, but if I recall, that's actually an ongoing thing that people are trying to figure out. Yeah, that's my impression too. Yeah, there's like, um, it's a big mystery because um, I know one of the things that happens is we, we can measure the masses of supermassive black holes, like way in the uh, kind of the distant past of, um, and stuff. And they're actually, they're too big where we don't actually know how you get a supermassive black hole as big as we see them and then like the age of the universe at the time, which is only like only a few hundred million years old. But <laughs> all the Milky Way, the chicken and the black hole, the egg. Just a thought. Uh, okay. Uh, I got another question, I have a question from <laughs> Chuck Watson also. Yeah. yeah. Would a planet orbiting a star in the galactic center ever see a dark sky? <laughs> That's a cool question. I think the answer is not really. Because some of, um, if you were to put a star, uh, like, right, I've actually, I've asked, I've simulated this question in like space simulators before. If you were to put a star, a planet, like near SO2, not necessarily orbiting SO2, but um, near it, um, and like stand, stand out there at some hypothetical like night. Um, the, some of those like supermassive wolf ray at stars would appear brighter than the moon appears to us. Mm. Like 30 of those <laughs> on top of, you know, a million other stars nearby that are also going to be immensely bright. So the answer is probably no, you would not have, be able to get a really kind of dark night, night sleep out there. <laughs> Got another question. 
a couple oh. of thank yous. Oh, yeah. thank yous. Um, no problem. Well, uh, one last question then if- uh, Jim William wants to, yeah. Oh, did he have a question? Yeah. I thought he was thanking us or thanking him. Go ahead. Oh, I just saw his name. I didn't see the text. It went away so fast. Is that a question, Tom Cotton? Or is... No, it, it, it was just a thank you saying excellent oh. presentation. Yeah. It does, okay, thank you. But uh, real quickly, uh, we're looking for exoplanets around other stars. Is there any way, is that too far off to know if there are stellar systems orbiting our supermassive center of the Milky Way, Sagittarius A? Um, I think it's... I'm not sure if it's technically impossible at the moment, but it's extremely difficult. Um, sure. I don't think anyone has um, has really uh, done a serious search at the moment. Um, I think there is some question about like whether the because the stars are so packed closely packed that um, they might disrupt you know planets. Or, yeah. And if anyone had life, I don't think so. That's probably out of the question too, but- Way too many supernovae that happened down there. The, the planet would get deep fried. I got you. All right, listen, look for something in your mail from us, my friend, and next month it'll be in-house and we hope to be technically in-house. And Jerry, I'm gonna turn it back off over to you real quickly, 11 o'clock Monday morning. We'll probably talk about Artemis One finally heading off the same day Christie has that, uh, special thing going on the fourth i don't eight. have it in my outline yet i mean i might add artemis one but um all right i don't know i've got to see it to believe it <laughs> well, i cleaned it up uh, uh, sorry one one final little question here susie meach says rory did do did you know daniel gilman oh yeah danny yeah okay. can we book him <laughs> um is he good I, don't what, I don't actually know what he's doing at the moment. Uh, he graduated a few years ago, but I, um, but I, mean, I don't, you could probably. Have him, have him contact me. You never know. Oh, nice. yeah. okay. All right. President One, Jerry, take over and we'll. Oh, can I just. Add, yes, Rory, go ahead with your comment. Uh, yeah, just uh, let me know if there's ever any like star parties going on, like near, like y'all are having a star party. I'd be happy to show up. I've, I, I've been looking for like, you know, me and my, my, my friends who would go start, I go stargazing with, we've been looking. Are you, uh, are you local here in Santa Barbara or are you in LA? I'm in LA, but like, I don't mind making the drive. Okay. okay. Well, we have a star party um, the second Saturday of each month at the museum. Oh. So in the, um, in the third Friday, Friday of each month at Westmont's observatory. Yeah. Nice, nice. I'll keep it. Yeah, I'll send that to, to some of my friends and maybe we can uh, drive up there uh, some Friday. Yeah, we have a calendar on our website, sbau.org, not dot com, but dot org. Okay, sounds good. We, okay. we also, um, we've had passels of uh, astrophysics graduate students from various schools show up. We do star parties in the summer at Refugio State Beach, uh, which is pretty dark. It's just a little bit north of Santa Barbara. Yeah. And uh, they go camp there and show up oh. at the star parties. Nice, nice. I'm sure there, there's like a um, there's a handful of us that do amateur stuff um, here at UCLA, but there's a lot of enthusiasm to like join other people and go do star parties. Okay, great. Yeah, wonderful. Maybe I'll. Call yeah, you. we welcome you. Good to have you. Yeah, and thank you very much for your talk. We appreciate yeah. it. Good job. Yeah. Good deal. All right, my friends. I guess we'll see you Monday morning and then next week at yeah. the big meeting. And Jerry, you want to gavel us closed? Okay. Well, yeah, this meeting is, um, well, I don't have my clock here. Technically oh, it's over. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Order. Order it's, the over. Court. it's over now. Okay. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody.